Today I'm joined by H.G. Tudor. He's the creator and host of the popular Knowing the Narcissist Ultra series, which is available online and which has proven to be an absolutely invaluable service for those recovering from a narcissistic encounter or those who seek to understand narcissism better. Thank you for joining me today, H.G. Thank you for inviting me along, Sonia. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, one of the reasons that you resonate so strongly with people, it's clear you have a deep insider knowledge about narcissism. When did you first come to understand that you are, in fact, a narcissist? Well, I've always known that I've been set apart from people. So when I was a child, I realised that I behaved differently. I also realised that I gained a response from causing people to do things. So I knew that I was different and set apart. I didn't have a label for my behavior until after university, when a former girlfriend who was a psychology graduate said to me, you're a narcissist. And I believe also that you're a psychopath. And I laughed and I was interested because of my intellect and I have a thirst for knowledge to see what she had to say about this. So I listened. And as I listened, and she explained it, and she did so not in a judgmental way, but rather as one would you know, dissecting a situation um, in keeping really with the way that um, she was uh, trained, and the way that she'd studied. So she explained to me the various behaviours that she had witnessed, both with regard to our interactions and how she'd seen me with other people, and link that to the relevant uh, criteria and qualities. Of course, I didn't agree with her. I just listened and just said, very interesting. But I recognise that much of what she said resonated. And thereafter, I undertook further reading myself and could see that there was significant force in what she was saying and that therefore there was a label for my behaviour. So have you, you're not actually diagnosed, is that correct? Yes, I am. Oh, you I are? I am diagnosed, Okay. Yes. So and, in late, later life, that, um, that occurred. And what is your diagnosis? That I both have narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Got you. Okay. Now, obviously, as people can tell, we're not revealing your identity. Indeed, I don't know mm -hmm. your identity. Why is that? No. The reason that I keep my identity hidden is because if I was to reveal who I was, it would have repercussions for me in terms of what I do professionally. I have a range of interests and I don't see that anything would be gained by revealing my identity in terms of the provision of the information. It's about the information rather than who I am. It's about what I am. And I need to maintain that anonymity to avoid threats to my control in other arenas. Got you. I mean, obviously, the information that you're giving, as I say, and, and you're quite right, it is about the information. And that mm. is so vital because you're actually arming people. You're, you're, you're mm -hmm. enabling people to protect themselves. So, you know, it's mm -hmm. swings and roundabouts thing. Where, you know, it, people might not be able to see your identity, but they will be able to garner a great deal of information from you over this next hour. So let's, let's crack on. Now, obviously, it's not new, but why has it in recent times become so trendy to call people narcs? I think part of it is that there is an increase in the prevalence of our kind. I think society as a whole has become more narcissistic. That doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's a narcissist because, of course, everybody has narcissistic traits. You have them. Um, I naturally have them. But where they are on the scale is different. If you have narcissism, that means you're a narcissist. So you don't have narcissism, but you have narcissistic traits such as pride and envy and anger and argumentativeness and so right. forth. So you have narcissistic traits. And what has happened is my kind generally control the narrative. So if you think about what you see in films, in books, in poetry, literature historically, and you'll be well aware of this as a journalist, that many of the things that are written about, that are spoken about, and that are uh, filmed and created are actually created by our kind. And yeah. so the representation, for instance, of this idea of what love is, if I can describe it as 
a Hollywood version. And that's created by our kind because that's the way that we see it. Right. And what happens is that many of our behaviours bleed into the mainstream. There are a lot of my kind, far more than people realise. Yeah. But what happens? So let's take, for example, the ridiculous of the trout pout, that ridiculous duck oh. pose that people yeah, mm -hmm. do with the selfies. Now, who will have started that? My mm. kind, mm. not something I do myself, but mm. somatic narcissists, those who are obsessed with appearance, they would start with the selfie. Mm. If you think about it, here's a picture of the Grand Canyon. Sure, you could take that picture and show your friends and then social media comes along and you can put up a picture of the Grand Canyon. Fair enough, why do you have to appear in the picture? And moreover, why do you have to appear in the picture with this ridiculous pose? Because you want recognition that you're there and you want people to comment. Of course, these people will be unaware narcissists that are doing this. They do this repeatedly and regularly, and therefore non-narcissists see this and they, oh, that looks quite good, that looks quite cool, I'll copy. Mm -hmm. And there's the herd mentality of human beings. And those individuals who aren't narcissists but have stronger narcissistic traits are more likely to do that. And if you think about a, a gaggle of 13-year-old girls, there's a group, three or four of them start doing this, the others will follow them. So they start doing it, and then another group sees it. And so it creates a more narcissistic backdrop, which is created by uh, our kind to begin with. And we talk about it being trendy. Part of it, of course, is the prevalence of social media, that not only is it easier to get uh, information out there about it, but social media is an absolute playground for our kind. Right. It enables us to right. throw out lots and lots of fishing lines to not only hook victims, and I use victim in the broader sense, not ne necessarily someone who's being um, emotionally or physically abused, but a victim is somebody who basically interacts with us and gives us what we need. Acknowledgement, I call it fuel, which is the emotional output of an under individual, which we need. So social media allows somebody to be sat on their sofa watching Coronation Street, take a quick selfie, do that ridiculous duck pose, bang, 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 in come the likes. They start gaining the fuel. They didn't even have to go anywhere. Yeah. Nice and easy. Yeah. So social media it, on its own is narcissistic, isn't it? It is. It caters. Um People often ask me, what did you lot used to do before social media came right, along? Right. And I said, well, we did have the telephone, you know. Um, it wasn't a case of carrier pigeon or smoke signals. <laughs> so, um, but social media uh, is narcissistic because it lends itself to a portrayal of, look at me. Yeah. Here's what I've made for dinner. Yeah. Really, who gives a rat's ass about your evening meal? Absolutely. And here's, here's, an, here's another picture of my baby. Here's another picture of my baby. Now, again, there are people who are proud of their child, and pride can be used in a healthy way. But of course, what happens is that because social media is an absolute gift to us, we utilize it to such a great, de de great degree, rather, it becomes the norm that it becomes acceptable. And then you have the, uh, the proliferation of uh, self-promotion through so-called reality TV, which we all know is heavily edited sure. and produced in a particular way. But that's all about um, creating a platform. I remember when the programme Big Brother came out mm. and a friend said, that'll be interesting, HG, a uh, psychological experiment to see how people uh, respond when they're isolated from the outside world. And I said, It'll be a platform for a load of narcissists to show off. Mm. And what did we get? Mm -hmm. Lots of narcissists. Mm. And whether it's pop idol, X Factor, et cetera. Of course, not everybody who appears on these programs is a narcissist, far from it. But they are honeypots for our kind. Yeah. And all of this self-promotion, the ability to put yourself out there at the drop of the hat, not only caters for our needs, be enabling us to assert control over people in a very easy way and gather our lifeblood, which is fuel, it also means that it becomes the norm. So people who aren't narcissists get dragged into doing that and it enables us to move amongst you far easier right. because we don't stand out as much. Yeah, yeah. What is the root cause of narcissism? Are narcissists born or created? It's a bit of both. I, 
explain it as that you have a genetic predisposition towards becoming a narcissist. So let's imagine that's the seed. And then there's a lack of control environment. That's the soil. So if you've got somebody who's raised in a lack of control environment, so an abusive childhood, but they don't have that genetic predisposition, they won't become a narcissist. So that explains situations where people say, well, I came from a, a bad home, but I'm not a narcissist. I didn't turn out to be that way. You have to have both. And you might have somebody who has the genetic predisposition, but not the lack of control environment. So no narcissist. But if you get those two things that come together, a narcissist is formed by lack of control environment. This can cover many different things. It might be, for instance, a physically abusive upbringing, a sexually abusive upbringing. It might be neglect. It might be not receiving any emotional support from a parent or parents. It might be living a gilded lifestyle. Everything's done for you. Right. You're told that you're fantastic and brilliant when actually you're not. Right. So it's um, not just deprivation. It could be an no. overabundance as well. Absolutely. Or a situation of really pushing the child to do well. I call it grade B syndrome. Oh, Close right. but no cigar. Right. Um, you scored two goals. Why didn't you score three? You got oh. 75% in your examination. Why didn't you get 85%? So they're supported and driven, but they're pushed too hard. All of those things mean that that child who has that genetic predisposition doesn't have any control. And one of the fundamental things that we must have is control. Our exposure to a lack of control environment alongside this genetic predisposition means we are hypersensitive to the issue of control. So that when the narcissism is formed, when we are adults, we see the world through a lens of control. We don't see the world in the same way that you do. Right. And so you might do something, for instance, make yourself a cup of tea, and, and the person that you're with who's a narcissist turns around and says to you, well, where's mine, um, Sandra Selfish? And you go, what do you want about? You made yourself a brew, you didn't make one for me. I didn't even know you wanted a cup of tea. Doesn't matter. Your act of not making that cup of tea for that narcissist offended that narcissist's sense of control. It's hypersensitive. How were you to know that it would do? And then the narcissist, being an unaware narcissist, doesn't realise that their retort is predicated on asserting control over you, right. getting a reaction from you, causing you to respond. So you might have, for instance, you'll no doubt have uh, interviewed and come across many sort of politicians, yes. and people sit there and often say, um, I couldn't do that, you know, being repeatedly questioned about the same point. And it's obvious that he's telling a lie. Why does he just tell the truth? Well, the fact is, what that politician is saying is his truth. You'll probably remember the interview with Michael Howard a number of years ago, um, where he was asked about whether he'd interfered in the decision, I think, about the sacking of somebody in the prison system. Okay. And Jeremy Paxman asked him again and again oh, yeah, and again. Oh, yeah, yeah, the again. infamous. Yeah? Yes, absolutely. That's right. Yeah. And, of course, he just sat there, cool as a cucumber. Yeah. Um, as Anne Widdicombe said, there's something of the night about him. That's right. Whereby, yeah. And, and he dealt with it. Why? Because in his world, he was right. And so he could just keep saying, any other people go, oh, I blush, I get embarrassed. Not him. Right. Because in his world, and he needs to assert control, every time Paxman said to him, you interfered, that threatens the control. And then he has to reject it. Right. And so he well, says, no, I, uh, deflects, etc." Well, that actually brings me very neatly to my next point. And that is when I approached you, I did say to you that your work has helped me because it, not only in my mm -hmm. work, but in my personal life, I have encountered a number of narcissists of different yeah. sort of severity what mm -hmm. what does no do to a narcissist <laughs> okay <laughs> we hate no yes quite simply yeah when you interact with a narcissist you only ever have three types of interaction with us everything that you do and say with a narcissist can be broken down to these three uh, interactions think of them like three boxes the first one is where you give us pure fuel. So if you say to a narcissist, I love you, you are giving us what I call positive fuel. That's a positive response. And you're signaling to us that you're under control. Not a problem with that. Everything's rosy in the garden of Narkdom. If you turn to a narcissist, if you ignore a narcissist, that's the worst thing that you could ever do to us. 
Because not only are you give, not giving us our fuel, our lifeblood, you are threatening our control because you're suggesting that we don't matter, that we're unimportant. So if you don't answer the, the telephone when we call you, if you don't reply to our text message, if you walk away from us, if you forget our birthday, you wound us. And that prompts, in most cases, an explosive and visceral reaction, dependent on the type of narcissist you're dealing with. Now, to come to the question of no, when you say no to a narcissist in person, you're issuing to us what I describe as challenge fuel. Because you're speaking to us, you're giving us fuel. Because there's the tone of your voice, your face and expression, your body language. So you are reacting to us. You're giving us fuel. But you're saying no to us. So you're challenging us. You're challenging our innate sense of superiority. You're challenging our sense of entitlement. We go where we want. We are access all areas. We do what we want with whoever we choose, whenever we please. So when you say no, you threaten our control. And in that moment, it is as if a little bit of us starts to fall away. There's a sinking sensation. Right. And then the fury ignites. Now, some narcissists will respond in an explosive way. And they'll say, what do you effing mean? No. And they'll give you a verbal tirade so that you're shocked into submission and you go, okay, okay, sure, I'll do it. When you do that, you've just given the narcissist control. Everything's all right again. Some narcissists respond by folding their arms and getting in a huff on and turn into the incredible sulk. And that's designed for you to be made to feel uncomfortable. It's another form of asserting control over you when you've said no. So you go, oh, stop sulking. Okay, I'll do it then. You've just given the narcissist control. So that manipulation works. In essence, no threatens our control and we hate it. Right. Right. Now, what I'd like to do also during this conversation is to be able to enable people to deal better with the sort of narcissist in their life and to understand it, because sometimes mm -hmm. it takes people a long time after the event. Let's talk about personal relationships. It can take people mm -hmm. a long time after the event to actually realize what has happened to them, what yes. has taken place. So I'd like to, first of all, why do narcissists target particular people? Because it, I, it is particular people, isn't mm. it? It is. We prefer empathic victims. Narcissists will choose anybody. Another narcissist, somebody who is narcissistic, meaning that they've got low emotional empathy, but they're not a narcissist. Normal people, which is the largest group on the planet. So they're people with emotional empathy, but for a narrow band of people. They're friends, their immediate family, some colleagues, neighbours. Um, and they have a mix of narcissistic and empathic traits, and then empaths. Empaths have lots of emotional empathy for a wide range of people, and they have strong empathic traits and less strong narcissistic traits, but they still have that bundle. Right. Empaths are our prime target because they are the easiest for us to ensnare and keep ensnared. You see... The empath, in effect, has an addiction to the narcissist. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if a narcissist targeted a normal person, and one thing that some narcissists do is what's called love bombing. Right. And so in a romantic setting, all of a sudden, this person is sending you 100 texts a day, speaking to you for four hours on the phone each night, sending you gifts, even though it's not your birthday or Christmas, telling you that you're the most wonderful person, that you've been sent from heaven above, all of these things. If that happens to a normal person, there's a very good chance that normal person will go, whoa, this guy's coming on a bit strong. I'm right, because they've got stronger boundaries, right? Well, in effect, they have no addiction. Right. So they recognize it. And I'll explain how the addiction works in a moment. Thank so you. With, with the normal person, they see it for what it is. They, they might not realize they're dealing with a narcissist, but they see this guy is trampling all over my boundaries here. Right. He's demanding too much of my time. He's getting on my nerves no thank you and they walk so they are less likely to get ensnared if they do get ensnared when the relationship turns sour and it always will do they basically go i'm not standing for this crap and they walk now with the empath it's different the empath has an addiction to the narcissist and this creates something called emotional thinking and it isn't about being hysterical it's about making decisions which are not formed on logic, but rather an emotional response linked to this 
addiction. Right. The addiction sits there and it wants to be fed. How does it get fed? By causing the empath to interact with narcissists, spending time with them, talking to them, doing things for them, thinking about them. All of those things feed the addiction. Now, if the addiction said to the victim, hi, this is your addiction speaking. I want you to go and spend time with a narcissist that abuses you. The victim goes, no, I'm not going to do that. So instead, it creates emotional thinking, which causes the victim to use flawed logic. So an example, going back to the love bombing, lots of texts are being sent. And the victim might think, oh, he's sending me a lot of texts. And then the emotional thinking kicks in and goes, yes, but he's just being really sweet and he's keen. Isn't it nice that he's taking an interest after that idiot you with last time, who probably was a narcissist and they didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. So there's a red flag being waved, but they don't notice it because the emotional thinking obscures it and they put it down to something else, like he's just keen, he's just sweet, he's just being really lovely. Right. And then when it goes wrong, rather than walk, the empath, because of their empathic traits and the functioning of their emotional thinking, causes them to do this. Why has it gone wrong? Everything was really wonderful, right. and now it's gone really sour. Is it my fault? Have I done something wrong? What could I have done to have caused this? Mm. Or maybe he's just stressed because of his work, or he's having a hard time because he's under financial pressure. Let's see if we can sort this out. And rather than walk away, the empath, because of their addiction, which wants to be fed, creating that emotional thinking, which obscures, keeps them locked into the dynamic. How many times have you heard people say about an individual who's been the victim of physical domestic abuse? Oh, I'd have walked, first time he hit me, I'd have walked away. I don't know why they stay. Right, right. Because that individual is in all likelihood with a narcissist. They have an addiction to it. Right. And they'll explain it away by, well, most of the time he's really lovely to me. Now, of course, that does not excuse staying with somebody because they beat you up. Yeah. But in the mind of that victim, their emotional thinking causes them to stay. It's a con artist. It wants you staying locked in the relationship with a narcissist. Right. It works in many different ways, sometimes to keep you in the relationship per se, other times to keep you obsessing with the narcissist after the relationship is over. So you're trying to find out who the narcissist is now with, snooping on social media, driving right. past the narcissist's house, going to war with the narcissist by saying, how dare you treat me this way? I'm going to take you down. I'm going to tell everybody about what you've been doing. I'm going to tell your boss, your auntie and your favorite grandma in Cleethorpes. So, right. and again, is that's keeping the individual locked in and that's not healthy for them. Is that what's known as trauma bonding? In effect, trauma bonding is, an, is a part of the addiction. Right. So trauma bonding occurs as a consequence of the interaction, but the addiction, it's part of the addiction because the addiction is formed in the empath during their formative years. Right. It's either, for most people, because they're an empath, that they want to be the empath. They don't consciously think this way. They don't think, oh, I'm an empath. I need to behave no. like one. No, exactly. They just do it naturally. Yeah. And of course, like an Olympic athlete, how can he be an Olympic athlete? Chained to a radiator in a basement? No, it's running around a track, isn't it? Yes. So he wants to be in that environment. So for an empathic victim, what's the best place for them to be the empath? With s somewhere where they can exercise their traits of decency, honesty, love devotee. Well, right. who tells lies? We yeah. do. Yeah. So your honesty gets a workout. Who perhaps presents as broken and in need of help? The narcissist. So your desire to heal and fix gets a workout. So perversely, the very person that allows the empath to be the empath to the fullest extent is the narcissist. And that's part of the where the addiction comes from. Right. Another oh, part. Okay. An another part of it is what I call imprinting. Basically, as a child, you had a parent who's a narcissist. Narcissism feels like home. You end up chasing the storm as an adult that you experience as a child. Mm. And it's so deeply rooted in you that you keep returning to it. You recognize that these people are doing bad things to you, but you're, why, why do I keep feeling like I need to be with these people? Why, for instance, why do I always choose bad boys? You're choosing yeah. narcissists, but the person doesn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So let's continue this sort of progress of a relationship. Mm -hmm. So after that love bombing, which you said never lasts for long, it, it does. It's not. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's a temporary thing. There comes mm -hmm. the devaluing stage, right? Well, an intimate relationship actually has different courses. Right. So, um, if we look at the anatomy of that uh, relationship, Sonia, let's say for instance, a narcissist meets a lady in a bar. She's a complete stranger. 
That's what I call a tertiary source. OK, they get chatting. There's a bit of flirtation. Numbers are exchanged and they agree to go on a date. They arrange to go on a date and they've spoken on the phone a few times. This person is now a secondary source. They've been elevated from tertiary to secondary. Their right. importance is continuing. Now, here's where there are two divergent paths. The first is this. What the narcissist may well do is he goes into the love bombing phase. The narcissism identifies that this person is an ideal victim. It does it instinctively. It recognizes that this individual caters to the prime aims very effectively. The prime aims are the ability to control, fuel, character traits, I'll return to that later in the discussion, and residual benefits. Residual benefits are things like having somewhere to live, someone to do your laundry, someone who might lend you money or give you money, um, look after you when you're unwell, give you access to contacts. Lots of different things fall within residual benefits. And those four things are the prime aims. And the narcissist wants those. And for most narcissists, it's instinctive. So the narcissism identifies that this lady is a potentially very good provider of those prime aims. So it's a case of locked on target. Mm. And the love bombing commences. Oh, you're the most wonderful woman I've ever met. You're really special. Oh, my ex, she's a crazy head. Watch out for her. Mm. That's the smearing uh, of the now painted black ex. And the narcissist goes into overdrive and he makes her then the candidate intimate partner secondary source, meaning she's on the fast track to become the intimate partner primary source. Right. That's the top of the tree. Right. And eventually the narcissist embeds that person as the intimate partner primary source, meaning boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, partner, cohab. This person so far has been treated to what I call the golden period. Everything's wonderful. It's rainbows and unicorns and glitter. <laughs> it's, it's, it's great sex. It's compliments. It's gifts. The, the extent of it varies. Some narcissists do what is called a bronze period, which is, as the name suggests, not as good as a golden period, but still not bad. Mm. When the individual's embedded as this intimate partner primary source, they will get a golden period, which will last roughly six months to 18 months, sometimes less, sometimes a little bit more. And then it will go wrong. And it always does. In the way that we're all going to die and the sun always rises in the east, devaluation always occurs. Mm. And that's because that individual's fuel has either become stale to us. Basically, we've got bored of you. Right. Or you're not giving us fuel as often and as, uh, and as in the amounts that we require. So our narcissism decides this person is a traitor because we think in black and white. And your failure to now give us what we need means you're threatening our control. So you are now going to be punished. And by punishing you, we, don't, we draw negative fuel from you by you being angry, by you being upset, by you being hurt. And that refreshes the relationship. Because mm. many people think, well, when it goes sour, why don't you just get rid of us? Right. No, because you belong to us. And we want to keep extracting those things from you. And invariably what happens when the person enters devaluation, the narcissist may well start to cheat, i.e. start searching for your replacement. So the narcissist starts conducting affairs. Now, so the, the anatomy of this relationship is a golden period, the love bombing, embedded, still in the golden period, entering what I call the sustained devaluation. And this is when you're shouted at. The narcissist cheats on you, beats you up gives you silent treatments, word salads, circular conversations, mm. lots of different unpleasant manipulations, mm, tells terrible. you you're not good enough. Mm. Yeah. And this is where it becomes very confusing for the victim because hitherto the narcissist praised you. Oh, you've got a real hard body. I love the fact that you go down to the gym and you wear nice clothes and you wear good makeup. All of a sudden, because you're now painted black, why are you always going down the gym? You're really vain. You spend more time down the gym than you do with me. And you, why do you spend so much money on clothing and makeup? It's obscene. And the victim's thinking, hang on a second. You used to praise me for my appearance. Why are you now attacking it? It doesn't make any sense. Mm. But rather than, of course, walk away, they go, why are you being horrible to me? All right, I, I won't go to the gym as much. And they start to erode um, their own position, their self-worth and their self -confidence. Terrible. Mm -hmm. So... This sustained devaluation goes on, and then there'll be a respite period where the narcissist gives back a bit of the golden period again. 
and the victim gets duped into thinking, oh, I've done something to get things back on track. Everything's yeah. wonderful again. Fantastic. It's horrendously manipulative, isn't it, really, though? It, horrendously. It, it is. <laughs> Absolutely. And so this continues. This is the roller coaster that people have heard about. Golden period reinstated, you're up. Into the evaluation again, you're down. And up and down and up and down. And this will go on until either we get rid of you, disengagement, you walk, escape, or neither of those things happen and it carries on until one of the parties dies. Oh, and some people are locked into this for decades. Mm -hmm. So that's the dynamic between the narcissist and the intimate partner primary source. There is another intimate dynamic, and that's between the narcissist and the intimate partner secondary source. This is somebody that's dating or a mistress or the other man. Mm. And there is a shelving dynamic. So you don't get the horrible devaluation that I've just described. You get slaps across the wrist, corrective devaluations. So the narcissist doesn't reply to some of your messages or tells you, uh, tells you off in some way, but generally treats you pretty well. And the narcissist meets you up for an afternoon and you have a great fun time together, have a bit of a bunk up in the back of the car. And then he puts you back on the shelf and he goes home to see his wife. Right. And he's conducting an affair. And those relationships can go on for years. And people are thinking, oh, he'll, he's, he said he'll leave his wife. He's going to leave his wife. You know, he's told me that things aren't good at home. That's all he's saying in that moment to control that person. He will have had sex with that person and then gone home and go, hi, honey, I'm home giving his wife a kiss and will probably sleep with her that night because he compartmentalizes. Right. And so for some people, they never become the primary source. They are the secondary source that is taken off the shelf, in effect played with. The narcissist has an hour conversation with them on the phone, off the shelf. They spend an afternoon with them, off the shelf. There's a text exchange for half an hour, off the shelf. And then they go back on the shelf and they don't hear from them for a couple of days. And then right. they take them off the shelf again, back and forth, back and forth, picked up and put down. And there's no there's no definition to the relationship. Right. And so is that breadcrumbing? They're like getting a little bit of something to, enough to keep them interested. You're on the right lines. That's right. Uh, it's it's <clears throat> breadcrumbing is absolutely part of the shelving dynamic. But what I've described there is taking somebody off the shelf and giving them a meaningful interaction giving them a meal if you will right the bread crumbing the bread crumbing is when you're on the shelf and and you contact the narcissist and you say um when are we going to meet again and the narcissist comes back with a bit busy at work at the moment thinking of you speak soon that's 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 uh, basically i see so it, it's giving yeah. you the impression that you're in their thoughts that they will get back to you as soon as they can it's sort of feeding you enough just to keep you in place is that correct absolutely absolutely right, right. you've nailed you've nailed it and right. so it's giving you that little little bit of crumb to keep you under control but basically patting you on the head and say be a good appliance sit on that shelf and be quiet please right. i'm right. busy with other things and of course when the narcissist says oh i've been thinking about you a lot it's a lie you're dead to us when we're not thinking about you it's as if you don't exist all that has happened is in that moment the narcissism has caused the narcissist to flatter that person by the revision of history saying, oh, I've been thinking about you all the time. Yeah. Typical lines are, I still have sex with my wife, but it's you that I think of when I'm doing it. No, it's not. Ooh. You're not in the narcissist's mind at all. Right. Interesting. So it's been my experience in personal relationships with narcissists that the real, the only way, I mean, obviously sometimes you can't go no contact because it might be, I don't know, a family member or whomever, and you have mm -hmm. to learn how to engage with them in some way. But there are situations where no contact is in my opinion, absolutely the best way to go. What do you think about no contact? We hate it. And oh, it's the most okay. effective, it's the most effective thing that you can ever do to a narcissist. Right. If you if you think confronting the narcissist and telling him that he's a grade A douchebag is the way to go, forget it. Right. Because all you're going to do is give us fuel, which is what we want. We will lash out at you, so you'll suffer, and you top up your emotional thinking. You failed. Of course, you'll think that's a good idea because your addiction has got hold of you and is making you believe that that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. If you run around telling everybody about what the narcissist has been up to, that's, the, that's not no contact. And we'll hear what you're doing. We will see it from our perspective that you are causing a problem for us. 
we will probably confront you and say, keep your mouth shut, stop telling lies about me, or I'm going to get a restraining order, uh, or I'm going to sue you for defamation and stay away from me and my new girlfriend. You're, you're a nutcase. Right. And so anything's like that, anything that causes you to continue the interaction or think about continuing the interaction with the narcissist is a breach of no contact. No contact is the way to go. And I explain to people that actually you can achieve no contact in more instances than people realize. But of course, what derails it? That enemy within the emotional thinking, I can't go no contact. She's my mother. Yeah. No, yeah. she's a narcissist. You don't need to, you shouldn't think, has she earned the title of mother? Has she ever exhibited emotional empathy towards you? Has she brought you up as a mother ought to do? Or does she really have that title because she gave birth to you and did nothing beyond that? Mm-hmm. And it's a hard decision for people to take. It and is. of course, the emotional thinking gets in the way because it corrupts their empathic traits, compassion. I can't. It's my mum. Actually, you can. Because she interferes in your marriage. She made your childhood hell. She's now affecting the relationship that you have with your children because she's always pestering the grandchildren. You can cut her out and you can. I have a package, how to handle a parental narcissist, that gives specifics about what to do in that instance. There are, I always explain to people that the absolute remedy is no contact because we hate it. No contact is hugely important because one, it removes you from the abuse. Two, it gives you time to recover. Three, it reduces your emotional thinking. And four, if you want to land a blow on the narcissist, that's the way that you do it because it absolutely crucifies us. Not for long, but it does because we, we will be forced to move on to somebody else. Mm-hmm. And we might come back and try with you again at a later juncture. But if your no contact regime is solid, you don't even know that we've tried right. and we're forced to go elsewhere. Right. But many people fail at no contact because they don't know what it actually is I have people who say to me, HG, I'm in no contact, but he keeps texting me. How do I make him stop? That's not no contact. Ignoring somebody's text messages isn't no contact. You have to change your number. Yeah, block. And uh, Yeah. Well, even better than blocking, right. change your number. Right. If, you, if, you block, if you block me, I'll just go to a different number and call you from there. Got you. <laughs> right. And so I, yeah, and I, <clears throat> I set out in considerable detail with the people that I advise all of the steps because... I know all the different ways that we will try and approach you, hoover you, and get round it. So it's the, it's it's like going to a burglar to, to find out about how to secure your home. Right, right. So, um, <clears throat> so no contact is the most effective thing to do. Where you have a situation that you feel that you can't no con- do no contact, that's likely that your emotional thinking is getting in the way, mm. and you need to sit back, sit down, and think: Is that logical? What I'm saying. For instance, I can't go no contact. I'm frightened what the narcissist will do. If you go total no contact, the narcissist can't do anything towards you because he can't get near you or she can't get near you. Mm. So that was emotional thinking, trying to stop you getting away from the narcissist. Right. And a lot of the reasons that people give for no contact is emotional thinking. And they speak to me and I explain that because I look at it from a dispassionate, objective perspective because I'm not affected by the emotional thinking. Right. And it's understandable that they think that way, but they can do something about it. Certain instances, it is more difficult. A classic one, of course, is if you have children with a narcissist. Mm. But even then, you can go no contact. Or if you can't, because a court order says that there has to be some involvement between the narcissist and your children, there are lots of things that you can do to shut that narcissist out so they don't impact upon you. And I have another package, which is how to co-parent with a narcissist, which goes into a lot of detail to help people in that difficult scenario, manage it and deal with it. The fact is, if you cut us out, we absolutely hate that. And it forces us to largely leave you alone because we hate redundant acts. Our narcissism won't allow us to keep trying if it's not getting us anywhere. Remember, it's a self-defense mechanism. Right. So if I keep coming around, let's say I keep coming around to talk to you and you sensibly don't open the door to me, okay, that wounds me. I keep knocking. It keeps wounding me. Eventually, my narcissism tells me, break off because you're being wounded because I'm trying to get a reaction from you. I'm trying to get you to acknowledge me, interact with me, and you're not doing it. So you keep affecting my control. So eventually my narcissism says, stop doing it. This isn't working. And what then happens is 
I shift to a different assertion of control, which is withdrawal, which is I walk off and I mutter under my breath, never wanted to talk to you anyway, issuing an insult into the ether. Right. Is we that always, way of always... so, sort of salvaging your ego and your pride? Yeah. Right. In effect, that's right, because we assert control in three ways. Directly, that's the hoovering. We come to see you, or if we're actually physically proximate to you, we do something to you. So we can assert control over you, and we can gain fuel from you. So our narcissism always goes to that first because it's double bubble. We get the control and we get the fuel. If we can't do that, we'll assert control over you indirectly. So we'll smear you mm. to somebody else. And they agree with us about what we've said. That allows us to feel in the unconscious, because most narcissists are unaware, that we have control over you. Or, as you've identified there, we salvage the situation by basically walking away. So if you're arguing with us and you won't give us control, we just put the phone down on you. We've now got control. Are we really controlling you? No, but in our world, we are. Right. And it comes back to um, a Latin quote, which is flecteris in aqueo superos acherontum vivo, which roughly translated means, if I can't move heaven, I'll raise hell. Mm. If I can't control you in your world, I'll just create my own world instead where I'm king. <laughs> and that's what we do. Yeah, it's a phenomenally important topic. I, re I think mm -hmm. it is. And, and one of the things that, I mean, I, I'm a complete novice in, in many respects, and, and I'm further along the, the line than many people who are entering this yeah. topic. But I think that there is a tremendous amount of misinformation about narcissism. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that you tackle, I think, particularly mm -hmm. well. Um, and, and I want us to be able to cut through some of those myths today. What are some of the most egregious sure. myths, in your opinion? that you can control a narcissist. You right. can't. Right. The, only way that, the only way that you can make us do something is if we wanted to do it anyway, or you go to the law, and the law imposes an outcome on the narcissist. And even then, some narcissists won't comply, and they end up in prison. Right. right. But you, you cannot be guaranteed to make us do something. So anybody that says, this one hack to get the narcissist to do what you want, they don't know what they're talking about, or this one simple idea will cause the narcissist to be like putting in your hand. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, the other one is that a narcissist can change. No, we can't. Not ever. It's not ever. Why? Two reasons. Most narcissists are unaware. Therefore, they don't know that there's a problem. So why change? And the aware narcissist, we're so effective. Why change? And the narcissism is hermetically sealed. It will apprehend a threat to it to steer the host, if you will, away from the threat. So we can't change. Anybody who says, oh, I was a narcissist and now I've changed is either a, a narcissist that's lying or they weren't a narcissist to begin with and they were mistaken. Right. Another myth is that, <clears throat> that narcissists feel lonely. No. We're often surrounded by people. We have to be because we need fuel from them. A narcissist might complain of being lonely. That's a manipulation to make you feel sorry for that narcissist. So you give him fuel and you signal that you're under control. Are narcissists always bad? No. Again, of course, what, what, what's good and what's bad? They are yeah. perceptions, aren't they? Yeah. The classic thing is terrorist or freedom fighter. Right. Depends which way you look at it. Right. So, for let me, instance... Let me reword that then. Are, are, okay. Is the aim of a narcissist always to cause misery? No, because most narcissists don't see that they're doing that. Right. Okay. Very few actually sit there, and these are the aware ones, that go, I'm going to cause a problem for this person because it entertains me. That does happen, but it's actually very rare. Most narcissists think you're the problem, and that's why they react. So, for example, mm. you don't habitually go around insulting people and mm. shouting at people and arguing with people. But if somebody came and parked their tanks on your lawn, you might have something to say about it. Just I suspect bit. you're a fairly robust lady. Oh, so indeed. You'd, <laughs> absolutely. So in, 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 a, in an articulate but firm manner, you'd have something to say about why. Because they did something to you first. From the narcissist's perspective, you do something to us first. That's why the narcissist reacts. Right. Because we have a different perspective on the world we have an alternate reality. So that many people think, I don't understand why he's not talking to me. Because in the world of the narcissist, he perceives that you have done something to him. That's why he's not talking to you. Right Now, 
you, in your world, didn't do it. But in the narcissist world, you did. It's like 1984. The narcissist world, the history is revised so that we've always been at war with East Asia and Eurasia's always been an ally. So, and that, that will change. So for instance, you say to us, why aren't you talking to me? And the narcissist says, because you were flirting with that man at the bar. Now okay. you were not, you were just talking to him. Right. But when you're talking to that man at the bar, that wounds the narcissist because he's hypersensitive to control because you should be talking to him. And so his narcissism basically does this. She is threatening your control by talking to him. We now need to motivate you, Mr. Narcissist, to do something to get control over her. So we are going to suggest to you, although you don't realize this is what is going on because you think this is reality, that she's flirting with that man. So that when she comes back, you are motivated to accuse her of flirting. So she gets upset and apologizes, thus coming under control and giving you fuel. In the same way, your stomach rumbles and you feel lightheaded when you're hungry to tell you to go and eat. The narcissist has to do something to motivate the narcissist to assert control. Because if it didn't, and the narcissist didn't bother, they would lose control and in effect, start to cease to exist. The mm. construct that exists mm. would fall apart. So, it, so when it comes to what the narcissist does, most don't actually intentionally cause misery. And a lot of people struggle to understand this because yes. they think, oh, they must, they must know what they're doing. That yeah. they, he, he knows, he knows what he's doing. And it's a considerably detailed matter that I don't have time, obviously, today to go into to explain it so people fully understand it. Sure. But it's something that is the case. Um, <clears throat> and also, of course, the other point of it is, is that our kind of very driven individuals, um, some of our kind are, are grandiose, uh, we have to be the best. And so many of the things that you enjoy in life have been created by us. Uh, at the moment, I'm talking to you on a particular uh, device, which uh, a now deceased narcissist was instrumental in creating right. and is one of the world's biggest and most valuable brands and that has brought uh, much uh, technological use around the globe. Mm. Many narcissists are innovators, entrepreneurs, uh, brilliant writers, brilliant sports people, um, you'll come across them all the time in your profession. Oh, constantly. I mean, you obviously, I mean, just I just want to just ask a couple more questions about myths, and then I'd Certainly. like to go on to narcissists in public life, actually, because you've tackled that, Certainly. and I think that's a fascinating topic. So you also say that narcissism is nothing to do with lack of self-esteem. Correct. Many people think the narcissist has low self-esteem. Yes. Don't. We have an excellent conceit of ourselves. Remember... The narcissism is a self-defense mechanism that blinds the narcissist to his failings. So this is why you get many narcissists who think that they're absolutely brilliant at things when they're not. Right. <laughs> right. Because their narcissism blinds them to yeah. it. Yeah. So there was a certain individual in the United States who's no longer in office who was the expert at everything. Yes. Yes, indeed. He, he didn't think, I know I'm not, but I'm going to say that I am anyway. He honestly believes that he was. And right. he's not the only one. No. Um, it's, it happens repeatedly. So narcissists don't have low self-esteem. We have an excellent conceit of ourselves. We think we're fantastic and brilliant. Certain narcissists are crybabies and whingers, but, they, but that's a manipulation. They right. don't actually genuinely think that they are downtrodden. They create that appearance what, to play control victim. you. Playing victim. Playing the victim. Control, yeah. Ab yeah. Absolutely. That. So yeah. many people think, oh, well, the narcissist has got low self-esteem. That's actually a misunderstanding, which I think has originated to make victims feel a bit better about themselves mm. by thinking, oh, he's got low self-esteem. Life isn't an easy ride for narcissists. So no. I'm, not, I'm not here as spokesperson in general to say that life is wonderful for narcissists. Many of them have difficult... Uh, difficult lives that they lead yeah. and there's a there is the constant pursuit apart from when we're asleep of fuel and the necessity of always asserting control some of us are exceptionally good at it others are not and they feel that emptiness that unease that irritation so if you've been rejected by a narcissist and he swanned off with the other woman and there he is sending pictures of him on the sun lounger in Porta Banus um <laughs> covid restrictions aside mm. and you're thinking oh look at him champagne charlie thinking he's having a great time believe me he's not inside 
There's that churning, that need to do something to assert control, but he doesn't know what it is, the itch that always has to be scratched. It's really sad, actually, isn't it? I mean, are narcissists always looking to constantly manipulate people? Unconsciously, yes. Every interaction is a manipulation. There are certain narcissists like myself are aware. I know that I manipulate and I get off on doing so. Most narcissists don't realise what they're doing. So when you accuse them of being manipulative, they're genuinely shocked. What? No, I'm not. And and they think you're the problem. Why are you accusing me of being a manipulator? You're the manipulator because their narcissism tells them that. They don't sit there thinking that they are a manipulator. They just do it instinctively. Why? Because the need for control has to be instantaneous. As I'm talking to you now, Sonia, if you heard a loud bang, you'd suddenly shrink down. You wouldn't think, oh, a loud bang has a bomb gone off. Is shrapnel flying through the air? I better make myself small. Because if you did that, too late, you're injured. Right. You have to re- respond immediately. The narcissism is the same. The narcissist can't do this. Ah, this person's threatening my control. Well, that's no good. What do I need to do to assert control? Shall I shout at them? Shall I insult them? I know. I'll give them a word salad to bamboozle them. That's what I'll do. Mm-hmm. It's too, too slow. It has to be instantaneous. Yeah. And yeah. the way that their narcissism has evolved is that they're not allowed to know that they're narcissists because their skill set is such that it has to happen instantaneously. It's, it's in the same way that, um, say, Sergio Aguero playing for Manchester City. He doesn't think, oh, I better put position myself there to take a shot on goal. He just goes. It's instinctive yeah. because he has evolved to such a level that he has that innate ability. That's why he's one of the world's best footballers. And somebody could say to him, Sergio, could you train me to be a really good footballer? And he said, well, I can train you to an extent. But if you've not got that innate ability, you're only going to get so far. It's the same with the narcissism. Certain narcissists, they just have that innate ability. Um, and it has to be that way because they're not capable of thinking about it. It has to be instantaneous. Right. I mean, you are a particularly, I think, articulate and aware narcissist. You're completely aware of your condition and, and you're yes. using that to help other people. Do you mm. feel remorse at any of your actions or is it just it's just the way you get through the day there's no remorse i'm not designed to have it there's no guilt there's no conscience Mm. those things are unnecessary for me they'd slow me down they'd hinder me if Mm. i had to feel sorry for people because of the things that i do i wouldn't get things done um it's very much it needs to be done therefore it is if you don't like it well that's your problem it's not mine Right. Wow. So look, let, let us, I mean, I can't believe we've actually nearly gone through an hour. I, I, I knew that this would be fascinating and it has been. So let us look at some mm. of, of narcissists in public life. And of course, as mm. we, we must say, of course, this is only your opinion, but there it are is. some who stand out more than others. And so, for yes. example, you have highlighted that you believe Meghan Markle, as one example, is a very royal narcissist. I do, yes. So over a period of time of studying her behaviour, it's not a uh, conclusion that one just jumps to. And it's by looking at the behaviour that she has exhibited over a long period of time that I reached, through my opinion, that she is a narcissist. And then that enables one to look at her behaviour through that prism. You see, what a narcissist will do and a non-narcissist will do can be quite similar but the motivation for it is entirely different and that aids the interpretation. So take, for example, you buy your neighbor some flowers to say, thank you for looking after my cat while you've been away for two weeks. You do it because you're governed by emotional empathy. You did it because of your empathic trait of decency. It's the right thing to do. A narcissist buys their neighbor some flowers to say thank you for looking after their cat while they've been away for two weeks. Similar act to the one that you've performed. But because we know that person is a narcissist, They cannot have done it out of emotional empathy because narcissists, we don't have any emotional empathy. Mm. The reason that that narcissist has done it is to control that person and to draw fuel from them. Similar act to yours, but completely different motivation. So when looking at Meghan Markle, I examined over a period of time, the behavior in interviews, the interaction. I took it from a variety of different sources, uh, print media, digital media, watching interviews, Lots of different places because, of course, uh, one can always say, well, there's a, there's a slant that's put on something in the way that it's, it's portrayed, etc. And I saw the sense of entitlement by which he operates, a lack of emotional empathy, uh, a lack of accountability for certain behaviours, 
the manipulations that occur, facade management, for example, triangulation. You see, a classic example was the old uh, bananas of empowerment. That was a brilliant example. Oh, for, for some the, people, would, for the prostitutes, for the sex so workers. Was, yes, yeah. that's right. Extraordinary. Yeah. So, exactly. Now, people say, "Oh, she was just doing something that was, you know, she was trying to do something that was sweet." That's what it looks like, but it's not because it shows a re- complete lack of awareness, Good sense God. of entitlement. Absolutely. I, I'm, I, I'm here. To, I'm here to tell you that you are loved. Even though I don't actually know you and you don't know me, but I'm going to patronise you and be condescending by writing on a banana, possibly making it inedible, because so because I have to control in the moment I'm not thinking about what comes next. And it's a, a crass act. She doesn't stand there and think, oh, uh, I know this is a stupid thing, but I'm going to do it anyway. She honestly believes that she's doing a nice thing because she's blinded mm. to what she is. But when you examine it, knowing what she is, you can see that she was manipulating instinctively those around her by facade management of, I really do care. But the act itself was crass, was a boundary transgression and was manipulative. Yeah, that's interesting about the facade because it's my experience that um, narcissists, they need to have a, it's almost like they need a strong sense of how they appear in the world and any threat to that is problematic. Absolutely. Some narcissists don't operate facades. I call them lesser narcissists. Right. These are the wrecking balls. And these are the individuals who is basically, it's my way or the highway. Don't like what I'm saying? Yeah, I know the type. Know the type. Yeah. 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 You know, call it as you see it. I'm the boss around here, etc. So there is no facade. And of course, some of those individuals are actually very successful. And therefore, their political, financial clout, they may have some charisma as well, means that they get their way. And everybody goes, he's a complete asshole to work for, but he gets results. Right. Yeah, yeah, I know the kind. So Boris, You know the kind, yeah. I do know the kind. I'm, I'm, I mean, literally, media is littered with the people that yeah. we are talking about today. I mean, it's yeah. ha- and you're right. It, 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 and that's something that I'd never considered before, is that while I have been focused many times on the sort of negativities of narcissism and how to survive them, how to get past mm. them, they actually do also bring with them other attendant traits that are good for the world, such as, as you say, creativity, being ahead yep. of, you know, the field, mm-hmm. you know. So, mm-hmm. so I think it's balancing it all up. But let's have a look at another, in your opinion, public mm-hmm. narcissist, Boris Johnson, a very political yep. narcissist. Absolutely. Now, good old Bojo, he's a clever, clever cookie. He creates this fantastic persona of bumbling Boris. Yes. The buffoon, the clown, the I've nothing to offer you but uh, these cups of tea, etc. And he plays it brilliantly. He knows what he is and he knows that he manipulates people. He would never admit it because an aware narcissist never does that because that's a transference of power. But he knows what he does and he creates this persona of bumbling Boris because it allows him to get away with everything. Yeah. Oh, it's not my fault. I'm it disarms sit people, wire. doesn't it? Exactly right. And so they just think, and of course, he plays into the populism as showed by his recent election victory. Yeah. And the fact that if you go back and look at all of the things that he's done, he walks away from, as in the thick of it, we'll call it an omni-shambles at many times. Yeah. And you've got to admire it that this man has this fantastic stickability that he can create something that doesn't work and he walks away with it. He literally sets it on fire, walks away. Yeah. Nothing to do with me, governor. And on to the next thing. And that ability, because if there was emotional empathy, there would be remorse and a sense of guilt for what has happened Mm. and be utterly dismayed by its failure. But the ability to just compartmentalize and then go, that was then, this is now. And he's, he's charming. Uh, we only have to look at uh, his um, romantic liaisons. That's uh, what's occurred there. Because if you were to look at the guy, you wouldn't think that he's an Adonis. Right. But it, he, he's got he's got pulling power because he's charismatic. Uh, he's uh, well read. He's intelligent. He's articulate. So he he draws people in, and he's very good at making people feel very important. And he he's got that Bill Clinton effect. Clinton was probably the master of this oh fantastic uh, cat you know real captain charisma you know eyes locking you are the center of the universe now absolutely brilliant at doing so uh so much so of course that 
uh, he did what he did and still his marriage remained intact. That's the power that he wielded. So with Boris, this is a carefully constructed persona that is utilized as you identify to disarm, to draw people in. And it's hugely effective. But political life is rife with our kind because (laughs) to survive it, you've basically got to be one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're if, if you're easily stung by the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune thrown at you, then political life isn't for you. And it is about having that hide of a rhino, which is actually it, it's it's quite ironic because of a narcissist is thin skinned in terms of the need for control, but is very, very good at asserting that control. And your upper echelon narcissists, the, the greaters, the upper mid-range through my categorizations are very, very good at being smooth. So they don't, they don't erupt. They'll right. go, oh, that's a really good question. And right. perhaps if I could explain, and it, you'll know how many times you've asked a question, it's, it's ATQ, answer the question, but they don't because they take you down another road and deflect. Yeah. And they're very, very good at it. That's yeah. a certain control, deflecting from accountability. Yeah. So whenever you say minister, uh, what do you say about the fact that there are children in the United Kingdom who are going out with uh, going without breakfast? Well, I'd just like to point to the fact that since we've come to power, 20 percent more children than under the previous administration. You're not answering the question. Yeah. But of course, that's brilliant yeah. deflection. Yeah. Uh, and uh, only someone who has our ability can do that in a convincing way because they believe that they are right and you are wrong. We have a complete conviction in what we're saying. Right. I find uh, Boris Johnson particularly extraordinary, I must be honest, HG, because we know how many times, well, we we probably don't know how many times, but we know that he is a compulsive liar, as indeed narcissists are. Are they? I mean, lying is an absolute trait of narcissism, isn't it? It is. It is. Absolutely. Um, uh, Long involved explanations. Right. They are there. Uh, The uh, the off-pat lie. They are... They're tools. The, the, yeah. the, truth, the truth, of course, is a matter of perspective. Most narcissists tell lies, as I was telling earlier, explaining earlier on, and, and it's their truth. That's right. why they do it so convincingly. Right. Other narcissists, aware narcissists, tell the truth, but because there's no sense of remorse or guilt, we can do so and don't bat an eyelid. Right. Well, because it Bo- serves our purpose. So with Boris Johnson, we all know about his lies and it's almost like in gaslighting, mm. obviously, another term of, of in to, do, to yes. do with narcissism. And it's almost yes. like at times the nation I, I, actually is not gaslighted because gaslighting is is gaslighting is something uh, I'm, I'm not articulating this very well. Actually, I think you probably can articulate gaslighting much better than I can. Well, gaslighting is basically affecting somebody's reality, causing them to question it. Right. So, right. <clears throat> so a simple thing would be um, the narcissist says to you on Monday, oh, I really like that red dress that you're wearing. Um, you look re- very attractive in that. And pays you a compliment because you're painted white and therefore you get a benign manipulation. That compliment is still a manipulation because it's coming from the narcissist. He doesn't genuinely mean it. On oh. Wednesday, you become painted black. Let's say the narcissist tried to call you in the afternoon and you didn't answer your phone. So you wounded the narcissist, you're now painted black. You decide to put the red dress on again to go out for dinner because the narcissist said he liked it. Right. You're now painted black. So the narcissist goes, what are you wearing that for? It makes you look like a slut. You're too fat for that. Right. And, you're, and, and then you go, right. why are you saying that? On Monday, you said you really like that dress. As soon as you say to the narcissist, on Monday, you said that you like that dress, you are telling him he's wrong. You are threatening his control. The narcissism goes, red alert. Right. Revise right. history. Right. Tell the narcissist he never said it. So then he says to you, I never said that. And he says it with utter conviction. That's gaslighting because you go, I know he said it. Why is he denying it? Yeah. Why is he lying? Yeah. Because in his world, in his world, if he's an unaware narcissist, he honestly believes he never said it. And I know that will sound crazy to people. Yeah, no, I understand. It's, yeah, it's a distortion of re- of one's reality, isn't it? And so that's exactly. It isn't gaslighting that I was thinking about with Boris Johnson, but it's almost mm-hmm. like we know all these horrendous things about him, what he's about, what he's like, mm-hmm. what he's done. Still, he was voted in. And it's almost like this collected, I don't know, what amnesia or whatever it is. It's all, I don't understand what it is that people still allow and enable this individual to rise when we know really what he's about. What is that about? Are, are we all in a collective well, daze? <laughs> part of it, of course, is that there are 
people that identify with what he achieves, and therefore they adopt a tunnel vision. And of course, social media has caused this with the echo chambers and people being very polarized with their views. So that basically, they, they aren't narcissists themselves, but when they hear an attack on their hero, they just dismiss it. The whole fake news yeah situation yeah, got you. yeah. So, so 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 if you say oh you know boris messed this up oh that's just mainstream media making it up they they just dismiss it right. and because boris accords with what they want to achieve so that is some I, people I other see. people are a little, other people see it in a little more shades of gray and they go he's got his faults but on balance i can't help but like him and he, he does the things that matter and so that person looks at it and says yeah he's got his faults but overall I still favor him. Wow. And that's because of the charisma that he has and that he's very, very clever because he stands for nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, I mean, yeah. you, you try and pick, he's a will o' the wisp, he's Scotch right. Mist. You try and pin him down and say he, does, he doesn't. And that's what many narcissists are very good at because it's the lack of accountability. Because if we can't be accountable, you can't control us. If you can't tell me I'm wrong, Ooh. I'm not accountable to you. Ooh. Therefore, I've got control. Wow. Wow. It is a game, isn't it? Listen, finally, yeah. HG, I'd like your opinion yeah. on how the narcissist will have been impacted by the COVID-19 period. Okay. Well, I'm going to throw a little plug in here for some of my work as well. Please I've do. written about this. Yeah. So on Amazon or on my site, you can find uh, three books um, the Narcissist in COVID-19 Lockdown, mm. The Narcissist and COVID-19, and a bit of a more fun thing, uh, The Narcissist, The COVID-19 Interviews, where I take different categories of narcissists and show how they're reacting through a series of spoof media interviews to the pandemic. The pandemic largely is problematic for narcissists right. because it's prevented narcissists from having proximate involvement with people. The most fuel we get from people is when we're actually physically with them. And therefore, by prohibiting that, that affects that provision of fuel, meaning that a narcissist is less motivated. Their energy levels drop. They could even go so far as to start to become depressed and self-neglect, etc. cetera. Um, other narcissists, it doesn't affect as much because they might be a key worker, so they're involved with people. Of course, they can turn to technology. So as the way that we're communicating now, that texting, all, all of those provide the opportunity to influence by asserting control and gaining fuel. But in general terms, it will have proven problematic for narcissists because it is acted as a, as a restraint. And of course, mm. we have a huge sense of entitlement. Mm. So many of the individuals, of course, that decide that they're going to hold a barbecue and invite 30 people around, not all of them are narcissists, but many are. Sense of entitlement, no sense of accountability, no emotional empathy for how that impacts upon people. I do as I please. And so the impact is that with some narcissists that operate a facade, they will go along with the, the mask wearing and the obedience in terms of the relevant regulations and the law. And it affects their fuel provision. But the three books that I've mentioned, um, I explain how generally COVID-19 has impacted upon narcissists across each one. As I mentioned, there's the fun one, which is a series of media interviews. And then I create a fictional situation involving a narcissist in a family unit who is affected by the lockdown. And it shows how that impacts on him over time and is a really interesting read, mm -hmm. not only in terms of enabling you to see different aspects of the narcissistic dynamic, but also if you feel that you want to get one over on the narcissist you'll derive a degree of pleasure from seeing what happens to him without giving too much away. Um, but as a whole, it's been problematic for many narcissists. Right. Fascinating. Listen, HG, thank you so much for joining me today. It has been completely fascinating, as I knew it would be. And I, and I thank you so much for what you're doing. It's a public service, what you're doing. I'm sure at times it's not easy, which is why, obviously, we, we talked about your identity and the, the importance mm -hmm. of keeping that hidden, because you need to be mm -hmm. able to also function in the world and earn a living. Um, that's so, right. Uh, yes, yeah. that's right, because I have my private life and my professional life where what I do here is completely separate from the classic compartmentalization. And I do all of this because I'm creating a legacy mm -hmm. so that my work will live on after I've shuffled off this mortal coil. And as part of because the misinformation irritates me, yes. I, I want people to understand. 
Um, I don't do it because I care. I do it because it works. It's working for me, but it's a win-win. You get to understand it in pinpoint precision and detail to enable you to achieve freedom from people that have caused problems to you in your lives. I create a legacy. So Mm. it works out either side. Mm, brilliant listen everybody please check out hg tudor who will not only teach you how to spot a narc but how to survive them as well hg thank you so much for your time today it's been great very welcome take good care of yourself thank you you too thank you